your energy world is changing beneath your feet in ways that most people are not aware of. And I hope to cast a little bit of light on some of these changes in the next uh, 50, 55 minutes. <laughs> so uh, I'll talk first of all about resources and uh, reserves and how that has changed completely in the last five, six, seven years. Uh, yeah, that quickly. And uh, then I'll uh, talk a little bit about the transformative technologies that has led to that. Uh, and then I'm going to uh, go through and dissect uh, the Canadian political, well, I'm sorry, the Canadian energy picture province by province and show you which provinces are going to benefit and which provinces are going to not benefit from the ongoing energy changes that are happening. So what you see here is a uh, well-known way of predicting the future. The past is the key to the future. So that ragged blue line is the oil production from the United States for 110 years. And that red smooth line, forgive me if I call the colors wrong, I happen to be red green colorblind, so you'll uh, bear with me. That smooth line is the best fit to that data. So we have a wonderful predictive tool, right? So if I just uh, replot that, there is what should happen using one of the most widely accepted ways of predicting the future. The past is the, hist the, past is the key to the future. Sorry, things have changed. Technology has totally changed the picture. So that's the old way of doing it. Now, even six, seven years ago, what we call rationalists who were thinking about technology implementation and such were saying, well, it's not going to drop that fast because we're developing you know, new technologies and we're getting more efficient at it. And, uh, but the optimists said, oh, no, it's even going to be better. We're going to get better ways to get out the, the, uh, the fossil fuels uh, economically. Well, that's actually what is happening. And it may even be like that. So the past is only the key to the future if technology stays constant. And that is a flaw of the prophets of doom. They always say, if things stay the same, but they never do. They never do. Things always change. Things are changing in the energy world more rapidly than sometimes uh, people like myself can accommodate. All right, these curves all show nice depleting oil production in Alaska and Texas in the Midwest of the United States, except for the last couple of years here since 2010. In fact, in some of these areas, it's only been since 2011 when, for some reason, these curves have all changed direction. It's even more radical than I can show on this picture, so I have another one. This is Texas. Texas that has undergone continuous depletion in their oil production for 50 years or 40 years since 1972, I think it, it is. And all of a sudden, things are turning around. In fact, Texas is producing more oil now than they were producing back in 1989. And that curve is not curling over yet. Of course, it can't continue to rise at that astounding rate forever. But for the last two years, it has and this is all due to a shale oil play called the Eagle Ford play, a huge play that actually extends down into Mexico, but the Mexicans do not have the technology. Pemex does not have the technology for this. So this is in southwest uh, south, uh, Texas. Now that's the shale oil. This is the shale gas picture. What has happened in the last five years? I'm sorry, in the last four years. Look at the price, $13 for a million BTUs of energy, and now it's $350. Does anybody know the price? Uh, pardon me, does anybody know the price at which uh, uh, gas becomes uh, cheaper than coal to generate electricity? Mm. It's about $5. In other words, electricity right now is cheaper to generate from natural gas than from coal. There has not been a new coal-fired line built in the United, or commissioned in the United States for the last three years. The carbon dioxide emissions of the United States have dropped below what the Europeans wanted them 
to sign on to in the Kyoto Protocol back in 1997. In other words, America has done better than the Europeans wanted them to sign on to. And in the last two and a half years, because coal prices are so low, and the Europeans have promised to shut down all the nuclear power plants, the carbon dioxide emissions per capita in Europe are rising for the last two and a half years. Four years ago, no one would ever have predicted that this would happen. This was inconceivable four years ago. The EIA does a great job of analyzing data, and look at this. Energy use per capita is actually predicted to decline. More important, CO2 emissions per dollar of GDP in the United States is predicted to decline. Technology. We're getting better at producing stuff without emitting as much CO2, without burning as much fuel. This is unprecedented. This is the first time in the history of the Western world that this has happened. A per capita drop in energy consumption with a continued increase in the GDP. So here are some predictions by the same agency of coal, natural gas, hydropower, etc. For example, hydropower is stable. Nuclear, essentially stable for 30 years out. Uh, Non-hydro renewables, uh, well, increasing, uh, maybe doubling in 30 years, but the people who are promoting renewables, of course, would like that to be faster. But cheap natural gas has caught up with them. And cheap natural gas reduces carbon dioxide emissions faster than you can imagine because it displaces coal. You can produce slightly more than twice as much energy from natural gas in the form of electricity than you can from the same amount of carbon dioxide produced by coal. So it's a little bit better than twice as efficient in terms of carbon dioxide emissions per megawatt. Look at that. That's a projection for the natural gas consumption to rise. And that's at the expense of coal. Okay, Liquids rising and maybe uh, dropping off in 15 years, starting to decline again in about 15 years. These are startling changes. They, are, they, are, uh, they were not predicted. They are unpre unprecedented. Natural gas, coal, and liquids production. Well, that shows you that predictions are difficult, especially about the future. So I looked this up on Google some time ago, and I found that this is ascribed to about 7,000 different people. But they do keep a top 10 list, and here are the top five, OK? We all know him. We all know him. You may not know him. This is Niels Bohr. And everybody knows him. OK? And we all know him. And it's been ascribed to others as well. OK. So predictions are difficult, especially about the future. And Jerry, or sorry, Jeff Rubin has, has learned that. He's published two books predicting that we're all going to hell in a handbasket because of the high price of oil coming up. And he remember one of his books was Your World is About to Get Smaller. <laughs> That's the danger of making predictions. Two years later, things changed. So recognizing the, all these dangers, I've decided to, uh, I mean, I, w I wish I knew what the future looks like, but that's not going to keep me from uh, making some predictions. <laughs> OK, but before I make these predictions, I want to set up a little bit more quantitative basis for these predictions. So what has happened recently? Over the last 20 years, we've seen an enhanced oil recovery revolution where new techniques to, uh, to develop uh, oil and strip more oil from old reservoirs have, have, uh, have emerged and are continuing to emerge. In the heavy oil business in Alberta and Saskatchewan, we've seen what we call the steam-assisted gravity drainage uh, revolution. And uh, that's a technology to get uh, heavy oil out from uh, four, five, six hundred meters deep, relatively economically and with a carbon footprint that is substantially lower than the previous types of technology for this, but not as low as mining. Mining has a lower carbon footprint, by the way, than steam techniques. Ten years ago, the shale gas revolution started. Four years ago, the shale oil revolution started. And we're going to see other revolutions in the future as technology is developed. 
Human beings seem to be infinitely shrewd and clever in finding ways of doing things that everybody thought was impossible. The gentleman here in the front row asked me about horizontal drilling before the, before the talk. I was at a conference in 1980 where a senior Imperial Oil person said, we drilled a horizontal well up at the oil sands area last year and blah, 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 blah. Unfortunately, horizontal drilling will always remain far too expensive to use. Hmm. Nowadays, if you go to your boss and say, I'd like to drill a vertical well, the boss looks at you and says, well, why aren't you drilling horizontal wells? As you'll see, these are the technologies that have changed things. So these huge, vast resources, which are currently locked up uneconomical, will eventually become economical. Technology moves on. Which means that fossil fuel shortages in the next two generations are probably unlikely. You remember, most of you, 10 years ago, how we were going to run out of oil very quickly? My, how things have changed. So again, the United States. Now we're bringing this home to Canada, OK? You might wonder why I'm going to the United States to bring a concept home to Canada. But here's why. Net imports. In, Can in Canadianese, that means net exports. We provide vast amounts of energy to the United States. In fact, the United States is our only client for the energy. This was as high as 30 31% just five, six years ago, it's already down to 19% and it's predicted to drop to 10% in about five more years and even continue to shrink in the future. Who provides that energy? Canada. If we can't export, our energy world is changing. It goes deeper than that. This is really a key factor for Canada. It's the largest dollar amount of GDP of all of our categories. It's three or four times the value of mining, more than agriculture, etc., more than tourism, etc. $125 billion a year. Look at that. This is, a, again, a, a prediction of what's going to happen. Predictions are dangerous, but this is 2011. Shale gas has come out of nowhere and is predicted to dominate the North American uh, energy, or natural gas picture, rather, in, uh, in another few years. Now, this is even changing Europe, because with the advent of shale gas, coal prices have dropped like a stone. So what's happening is that electricity generators in Europe that have the capacity to do so are buying cheap coal to generate electricity, therefore carbon dioxide emissions are rising. It's interesting that the shale gas revolution in the United States is affecting the price of coal in Tianjin. It's a small world. Reserves views are changing. So back in 1982, we thought there was so much natural gas in the world, and this didn't change very much over a few decades. And then all of a sudden, in the last decade, we think there's about three times more than we thought before. New paradigms. Furthermore, the technology has evolved to allow these to be developed. I don't know what the future is going to bring in terms of reserves, but it's not going to shrink. The last 10 years, view of gas reserves has changed completely. Same thing in heavy oil. We now believe that worldwide, we're going to be extracting from our oil reserves here on the order of five to five and a half billion barrels of oil. Sorry, I dropped three orders of magnitude, trillion barrels. What's three orders of magnitude between friends? I mean, you can forgive a little numerical error like that, if you would, please. But the amount that we, and by the way, this number is, again, probably conservative, because technology does not stand still. Some believe that the liquid petroleum endowment of recoverable reserves is even larger, and technology developments will increase the ultimate recovery factor. Canada now provides about 32, 33% of American imports of oil. But importantly, this figure, 
which was the, uh, the estimated, uh, pardon me, uh, in uh, March of 2012, about a year ago. This figure is even lower now. It's down about eight, and it's continuing to drop. But Canada is continuing to increase its share of American imports. Now you might say, gee, that's nice. Americans are buying Canadian oil rather than other oil. Well, before you get too enthusiastic, to buy oil from Saudi Arabia is about $110 a barrel, and to buy oil from Alberta and Saskatchewan is about $75 a barrel. Draw your own conclusions. As long as Canada is providing much cheaper oil, we will be a favored source. With the shale oil revolution that's happening, United States imports will drop more. So essentially, transformative technologies have permitted, it, permitted this. The uh, multi-stage hydraulic fracture in horizontal wells has allowed us to open up cracks in the earth to allow oil to drain, allow gas to drain to these horizontal wells that previously could not drain. These wells are up to two, two and a half kilometers long sometimes, and they're maybe three, four kilometers deep. Uh, in the Horn River of BC, the three and a half kilometer deep, two kilometers long, 16 of these fracturing stages along the well. Horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing are transformative technologies. This is a hydraulic fracturing operation in the United States. And uh, you can see they're hydraulically fracturing this well right there. And they're putting in a lot of energy. You can count the number of pumping trucks. And this is not the, by any means uh, the biggest job around. This is a modest sized job. And they generally will go in and fracture about, one well, uh, about five wells or 10 wells, you know, one after the other, each one taking four or five days. So it's a long operation. It's a transformative technology. This uh, multi-stage horizontal fracturing, pardon me, multi-stage hydraulic fracturing is fairly new. By the way, one of the key patents, I shouldn't say one, several of the key patents are held by Canadians. Steam-assisted gravity drainage, as I mentioned, it's also a transformative technology. It's opened up resources that were not opened before. And we're opening up resources from this kind of rock. Fractured rock, but these blocks in, in between the fractures are low permeability. So if we can open up all those fractures and allow the oil and gas to drain very slowly from those blocks, then we have a good well. That's how it works. Transformative technology has allowed us to get oil and gas from low permeability rocks. Here's what a steam-assisted gravity drainage site looks like in Alberta. Each one of these is one of those uh, double well steam chambers that I showed you on a previous slide. Canada is no longer production limited. But who's going to purchase our oil? Well, mm, let's move on to this one, yes. The Canadian context, uh, Al Alberta produces more oil than all the rest of the provinces combined and then some. So here's the projection for the increased uh, production of, uh, of bitumen. But the question is, who is going to buy it if we can't get it to market? This is production. If you cannot transport it, then you have a problem. Where will it go? So here's a pipeline map of Canada, and here are some options. The Enbridge Gateway Project, which may never be approved, we don't know. It doesn't look very good for Enbridge right now. This is the doubling of the Trans Mountain Pipeline, and the mayor of Burnaby has publicly said that he doesn't want it to happen. Burnaby is the port where the pipeline uh, reaches tidewater. This is the famous, or maybe infamous, Keystone XL pipeline. The Nebraska gov governor has said, hey, it's fine now. It's fine now because they made this little jog in here and, and avoided uh, the sand hills. The US Senate sent a letter to uh, President Obama many, many weeks ago now saying, please, can we move forward with this? And the industry lobby is quite strong on this. 
The southern part of the United States wants access to cheaper Canadian oil. Nothing has happened yet. So TransCanada Pipeline Limited a few weeks ago said, we're going to shut down the TransCanada gas pipeline to the east and convert it to oil. Hasn't been approved, and it's going to be some time before it gets approved. And once it's approved, it's going to take some time to do it. If it's done, there's going to be major extensions to St. John's, Montreal, and maybe up to St. Lawrence, and I'll explain why. Line 9B uh, from Sarnia to Montreal uh, is being applied for as we speak for a reversal so that Western Canadian crude oil can get to uh, Quebec. Currently, Quebec does not use Western Canadian crude oil. So let's examine the nature of the energy exports from the various Canadian provinces. And I'm speaking only of exports to the United States. I'm not speaking of within Canada transfers. Starting from the left coast, I'm sorry, the, the west coast, uh, BC. Ha, 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 I heard somebody say, uh, okay. Okay. Uh, BC exports electricity and natural gas. Alberta, huge amounts of oil, little bit of gas exports to the United States. Saskatchewan exports heavy oil to the United States. Manitoba, hydropower. Ontario, hmm. <laughs> Ontario doesn't export or import energy. It's roughly in balance. <clears throat> Quebec, massive amounts of electrical power to the northeastern part of the United States. Usually when the Americans have a have a, uh, like they say, when, an Ameri when the American economy coughs, you know, Canada's economy catches pneumonia. Well, in hydropower, if the Quebec hydropower lines, you know, shut down, all of northeastern United States is in the dark. They're a big client. Uh, Prince Edward, uh, Nova Scotia ships gas to the states, offshore gas, and Newfoundland, of course, uh, ships oil. And of course, everybody talks about the Arctic. Well, the fact is that no major development now, and probably no major development in the next 25 or 35, maybe 40 years. Why? Just simply because we have found so much oil and so much gas in places like the United States and southern Canada, Alberta, BC, that development of that is cheaper than trying to put in new infrastructure in the Northwest Territories or up into the Arctic Islands. With the exception of one very interesting case. The Canal uh, River, shale oil play. And for those of you uh, of a certain age, you may remember that oil was produced in Norman Wells during World War II and shipped across to, the, to Alaska as a buffer against Japanese cutting the oil lines. That was called the Canal River Pipeline. Okay. My father worked on it for a brief amount of time. So that's where it is. It may be the largest new oil play in North America, and it will soon start hitting the news when drilling starts. It's, uh, and this is just the best of the land. This is 50 kilometers, so you see it's 100 kilometers wide and 300 kilometers long, roughly. But the numbers are absolutely astounding. The geoscientists say that there's a 50% probability of 270 billion barrels of oil in place. 270 trillion cubic feet of gas, 38 billion barrels of natural gas liquids. This, trust me, is absolutely astoundingly huge. If only 10 or 15 percent of that is technically recoverable, it will have a major impact in North America. So we're going to have other plays in the far north, but not in my lifetime maybe not in the lifetime of your grandchildren, as long as we continue to develop oil and gas in the more southern climes where the infrastructure is uh, in place already and the need. Developing locally is, a, is an important issue. Just to remind you, that's where it is. And there's already a 10-inch pipeline, oil pipeline, going from Norman Wells down into Alberta, tying into the grid. So the oil companies with leases up in the Canal River shale oil play are already talking about using the same right of way and putting in a 24-inch pipeline from Norman Wells down to Alberta. 
So who's doing all this shale and uh, oil and shale gas activity in the world? Well, it turns out that forget about the uh, current resources. It turns out it's all North America. And this is a prediction for 20 years from now. This isn't entirely a North American phenomenon. We are literally a generation ahead in the technology compared to Europe, China, South America. It's not your father's industry anymore. It's not just get a rig, drill a hole, see what's there. It's extremely sophisticated. So we have this re regionalization of, uh, of uh, local markets. More and more we see that when it comes to uh, priority given uh, economy versus environmental issues, the environment uh, tends to be, shall we say, put aside a little bit in favor of economic development. We know from all kinds of experience that consumers will not switch to a more environmentally friendly product if it is significantly more expensive. With the exception of people in this room, of course. <laughs> and my wife. Energy independence. Development of shale gas and tight oil in the Williston Basin is leading to a loss of markets for Canadian crude oil. And electricity. If we have cheap natural gas available, uh, we're shifting from coal to natural gas, like here in Ontario and in BC. But if our clients in the United States can buy the, na buy the natural gas cheaply and generate their own electricity, why would they want to buy Quebec electricity? These are big, big factors. All right, let's look at BC. Small oil production potential, huge potential from shale gas. I mean, these are really fabulous reservoirs. There's a few of them. The first LNG exports are possible, not likely, but possible in four years. So has BC won the lottery as, you know, there's an election on and uh, the current premier has claimed that, uh, that the natural gas revolution in BC has been because of, uh, because of uh, her government and, uh, and claiming that this is going to bring a lot of prosperity to BC. Well, oh, this is the world's largest fracture job, by the way. I, I can't remember the number of trucks here, but this is up in northeastern British Columbia, and this fracture job continued for 110 days. In, inside of these little huts here are 16 wells, and they went from one well and then to the next and then to the next, taking about six days, seven days for each well to do all of these stages of hydraulic fracturing. All right, so currently there are no BC gas exports except to the United States. LNG to Japan, South Korea, maybe in four to five years. And the price there right now is 13 to $15 uh, for a million BTUs, that's great. But liquefaction, regasification cost about 350. And will the price be the same in 2018? No, because Qatar, Australia, Indonesia, all of these countries are developing LNG faster than we are. Good luck to BC. By the time they get their LNG plants and pipelines in place, the price might be different enough that it's not going to be the lottery. It's going to be a struggle. So there's going to be massive LNG exports eventually. Four LNG terminals are planned in the Kitimat area. Alberta wants to tie into this to uh, get some export gas. BC will still supply some natural gas to Washington and Oregon and California. BC Hydro's high-priced exports of electrical power to the United States will be threatened. They are threatened right now. The United States in the northern tier, in the western tier, can now generate local power, and we, we can generate it at different scales. It doesn't have to be huge plants. With natural gas shipped in from some of these shale gas plays, more economically than they can buy BC hydropower. So what can BC hydro do? Only one thing, cut their prices to remain competitive. Alberta, I believe that oil exports will slowly grow. Keystone Pipeline is probably going to go ahead. I, know, I, I don't think Gateway will, but we'll see. But even if it does not, there are other pathways that will uh, allow some small shipping increase. There's some jiggying of the pipeline system, uh, rail transport, these type of things, okay? Uh, 
If the Trans-Canada pipeline is given permission to switch to oil instead of natural gas, then we do have, a, uh, uh, I shouldn't say we, Alberta and Saskatchewan then has an exit for the production capacity that they are developing. However, gas exports to the USA will disappear. Gas exports to the USA are down to 50% of what they were five years ago. In another five years, the net exports, net across Canada, net exports to the United States may be almost zero. So, here's all that bitumen here. Where is it going to go? Uh, just a little map of Alberta, just to put the things into context. That's Edmonton and Fort McMurray. That's the maximum possible mining area because of the depth of overburden for uh, the oil sands mines. So that's where you see all those pictures from. And I do want to point out that uh, the maximum, maximum mining area is only 60% of the area of Los Angeles. Uh, it's not as big as, as many people think. It's actually a fairly small area. Saskatchewan, heavy oil and synthetic crude oil from heavy oil to the United States Midwest only. That's what's going to happen. Saskatchewan is being affected by the Bakken Shale oil play just south of the border. Pipeline capacity is shifting to the Bakken light oil. Maybe the, the exports of Saskatchewan heavy oil are going to shrink because they can't get pipeline capacity. That looks very probable in the short term. Heavy oil prices are stable for now, but only as long as the price for the heavy oil is substantially less than the Bakken light oil, which is now about $90, $95 uh, a barrel. You have to have a $10, $15 discount because it's heavy oil. So that means you're going to sell your heavy oil at $75. And remember, on the east coast of the United States, the Irving Refinery in New Brunswick buys international oil at $110 a barrel. Overall, the impact of the shale gas and shale oil revolution is going to be minor. And in southern Saskatchewan, they're going to develop the Bakken themselves. It spreads off into Saskatchewan. So here's an interesting map of North America taken with a satellite, you know, and doing a little bit of image enhancement. So that's uh, New York and Toronto, I think, Detroit. And here's Winnipeg. And remember, Manitoba Hydro provides a lot of power to this area. And here's Regina. And what the heck is this? That's Saskatchewan up here, of course. What is that? Does anybody know? There is no gas gathering system in the Bakken shale oil play, so the natural gas is allowed to be flared. The carbon footprint is quite high. So this is flaring. I would like to think that that flaring wouldn't happen in Canada. But look at that. It's a, blo a blob of light strong enough from the hundreds and hundreds of natural gas flares just being burnt, wasted. Manitoba, oil and gas uh, imports, that's not quite the right word, transfers will come from Alberta and Saskatchewan as they do, but they sell a lot of hydropower into the United States, then to the Dakotas and Minnesota. Now, natural gas power generation in the United States is cheaper. Manitoba Hydro is already lowering its prices. The impact of this energy revolution is hitting every single province almost, with the exception of Anne of Green Gables province. Also, when they were establishing provincial lines, Manitoba didn't do a good job of carving out a big chunk of a sedimentary basin here. The potash kind of stops at the border, and the oil stops at the border and everything. Poor Manitoba was kind of left out. Uh, but they do have hydro, and they do have mining in the far north, of course. Ontario, of course, the largest oil and gas user in Canada. Oil shipments in the future will probably come exclusively from Western Canada, with a little bit of shale oil from uh, North Dakota. But the gas that we are burning in our homes in five to eight years will likely come almost exclusively from the United States. The first natural gas imports from the United States started last year. And pipelines, as we speak, are being built. The Trans-Canada pipeline will no longer be needed. Hydro will come from gas-fired power plants, now much, much cheaper than nuclear. So no more nuclear plants in our lifetimes. That's my prediction. Cheap shale gas turns out to be a boost for Ontario. This is the construction of the Halton Hills uh, gas plant. 
And that's where your power in the future is going to come from in Ontario, more natural gas-fired power plants. Quebec. Oil is not imported from Western Canada. It comes from Africa, Middle East. Gas through the Trans-Canada Pipeline, mainly from Western Canada. In the likely future, oil pipeline extension, the TCPL, to Quebec will bring cheaper Alberta and Saskatchewan oil to Quebec, to Montreal. And now at Montreal, that oil is at tidewater. In other words, now it can be put into a ship and sent anywhere in the world. I think, my prediction, there's going to be a rebirth of the refining industry in Quebec with extra refining capacity built, and I'll explain why in a moment. Shipment point for crude overseas, of course. Now, the uh, Quebec Hydro is already dropping its prices to its client in the, clients in the United States because Vermont, New Hampshire, all, and the companies in those places have been knocking on their door saying, if you don't lower your prices, we are going to build a shale gas electrical generation plant and undercut your prices. So Quebec Hydro has to respond. You know all those projects up in Ungava, uh, not quite Ungava, but up in the, in the northwest part of Quebec? they probably are on hold for a generation, maybe more. Because at the price that Quebec Hydro is going to have to sell its electricity in a few years, those will not be worth building. Quebec, I predict, will drop the shale gas moratorium that they put on two years ago in the next 24 months. I just put this uh, shale gas prospect region here. That's where there's very good shale gas prospects in Quebec. I just put it on a map that was provided by Quebec Hydro showing all the transmission lines uh, down to uh, export in the United States. Anyway, I believe that in the next 24 months, uh, the province of Quebec will drop their moratorium on shale gas because of the pressure of the need for energy. No impact on Prince Edward Island. New Brunswick is developing their shale gas already. The Irving refinery in St. John's wants more heavy oil. It's the major refinery in the East, and uh, they market their products to the East Coast of the United States, and that's a key thing. They would like to have more heavy oil. Already, a few train shipments have gone to St. John, and there is talk of expanding the Irving refinery from 300,000 barrels a day to 500,000 barrels a day if Western Canadian crude reaches New Brunswick. And of course, New Brunswick will generate their electrical power in the future, no longer from coal or oil-fired power plants, but from shale gas. So this is the Irving refinery in New Brunswick. Nova Scotia has been the foundation, sorry, natural gas has been the foundation of the Nova Scotia offshore uh, exploration and production industry. Now the cheap, cheap shale gas can be piped easily anywhere in the United States, this likely means for Nova Scotia, no more offshore development. Unless somebody gets lucky and finds some good oil, but not gas. So the existing assets will be depleted for the next 10, 15 years because they are already paid for. And no new assets will be built in the foreseeable future. Only if gas prices rise substantially. Of course, the, the citizens of Nova Scotia will benefit from cheaper natural gas. Uh, and cheaper ga electrical uh, generation uh, costs. So that's the location of the, uh, of the major uh, field, the Deep Panuka development offshore, uh, offshore Nova Scotia. And there's Sable Island, just for reference here. Will further natural gas uh, take place in uh, Nova Scotia in the next generation? Will it be? I don't think so. Newfoundland and Labrador. There is now shale gas exploration going on in the west coast of Newfoundland. Oil development offshore will continue, but the shale gas means a low electricity price in the northeastern United States. Now you've all heard Newfoundland talking about more electricity generation in Labrador and shipping it through an under the sea uh, electricity uh, conduit into Nova Scotia and then overland to the northeastern United States. It's not gonna happen. It can't compete with cheap natural gas. The low gas price also means that the well-known, very 
extensive gas deposits offshore Labrador, going all the way up to Baffin Island, will not be developed. So this is the area where uh, they're looking for shale gas in western Newfoundland, and it's, uh, no, it's, well, we'll see. It looks pretty good. So here's my personal prediction about the future here. U.S. shale gas in Ontario and Quebec will largely displace Western Canadian gas, maybe entirely, and Ontario will, uh, Quebec will develop its own shale gas industry, although much more slowly than it has in the United States. The Trans-Canada Pipeline will probably eventually have about a one million barrel of oil a day capacity to the east, where it will reach tidewater in Montreal, and with pipeline extensions to New Brunswick and St. John's. Products will be exported to the United States. Why? Because the northeast part of the United States is under-equipped with, they don't have enough refineries, so they buy product. In fact, that's a big source of income for the Irving Refinery in New Brunswick right now, is shipping products to the northeastern United States. And the Gulf Coast refineries in the United States, they buy uh, cheaper heavy oil and some uh, lighter foreign crude and some West Texas Intermediate, and they ship the products up to the northeastern part of the United States as well. In other words, arbitrage is going on on a continental basis. I think that one or the other of Gateway and the tra or the Trans Mountain will, uh, will go forward. And by the way, you see, th this is like uh, 25 years from now. I'm not talking about five years. And I think that 25 years from now, we'll be shipping about maybe a, bar a million barrels of oil a day uh, to Asia. And of course, uh, about two million barrels of oil a day to the United States. Right now, it's, it's not at that level, but it uh, could be. And uh, nothing from the Arctic. And uh, this figure is wrong. This should be six to seven million barrels of oil a day in Canada by that time, about seven. And furthermore, 40 million tons per year of liquefied natural gas to Asia shipped mainly from British Columbia, some from Alberta. I remind you, this is a personal prediction. <clears throat> so the overall Canadian energy future. Energy exports to the United States are dropping. You know, natural gas exports net exports will disappear within five years. Oil exports to the United States are not rising. Electricity exports to the United States are constant in terms of power, but they're dropping in terms of what BC, Quebec, and Manitoba can charge. That's having a massive impact. impact. Remember, Quebec Hydro is a major, major earner in Quebec. And they can't sell their electricity now for the price that they used to one year ago and it's gonna get worse before it gets better. Oil exports to the United States will continue to rise slowly as long as Canadian oil remains cheaper than international oil. Lower oil prices two to four years from now are widely predicted by many people because we seem to be having a, a, a development of oil everywhere. Uh, there uh, seems to be a, an arriving glut of oil in the world. So a lot of people are talking about a 65 to $75 uh, barrel price three, four years from now. Some very distinguished people have made those uh, predictions. Canada's economy will be profoundly affected. We are a major supplier of energy to the United States. That is dropping. So your energy world is changing, and it's changing rapidly. And be careful in making predictions. Thank you. The question is, to what extent has the uh, scare of losing fossil oil uh, caused uh, increase in efficiency? And uh, it's a complex answer, and I don't know all of the details, of course. But for example, that kind of worry did lead uh, the Obama presidency in the first year of, the first, uh, of his first uh, term to uh, push towards better average mileages for the fleet. Uh, and that, of course, took place. Uh, now you can buy, of all things, a Ford F-250 that gets 36 miles per gallon. I mean, that's astounding. That is really <coughs> astounding. Excuse me for using gallons, uh, but uh, 
There's only three countries in the world that don't use Système International, I understand. Uh, maybe I'm wrong here, but Bhutan, Yemen, and the United States. So it's, uh, <laughs> they were going to switch, you know, at the same time we switch. So the answer is, yeah, there's a lot of energy efficiency. And we've been getting better and better and better in using our energy, our fossil energy, and electrical energy to create goods. What cost us a dollar of energy in 1980 to produce now costs us about 44 cents. The same thing. That's astounding. I can't point to one technology. It's the accumulation of all kinds of small efficiencies. It's an ongoing technological revolution. It's part of this revolution, I suppose. Because our energy world is changing because the demand is not increasing endlessly because of better efficiency. Your question is very difficult to answer in less than three weeks. But uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's an important question. Striving for efficiency is important. Yeah, I was wondering, um, in terms of natural gas for power, um, wouldn't uh, Europe benefit from, there's a really two-part question here that I have. Uh, the first part, I mean, wouldn't Europe benefit from more shale gas Reserves, like, do they have some there? Are there some in Russia? Like, Europe is now. How many questions? Itself. How many questions are you going to ask? <laughs> let, let me let me answer that one. But, but, yeah, but let me answer that, and then you can ask the next one. Last Friday, the British Geological Survey said that they're going to be coming out with a report in a couple of weeks, showing that Britain has a hundred years of shale gas resources at current rates of consumption. For a hundred years. Too. I'm just speaking of Britain. Europe is different in different countries. Hungary may be the richest country in Europe in natural gas. Oh. Ah. Switzerland, well, they just have the banking industry, you know. Okay. That's right. And what about natural gas cogeneration? We could have that here. We could we do. natural gas here and use the heat. Sure. Rather than just we, but even without using the heat. No, but for electricity, like in big generators. Of course we could. But even without using the heat, as you know, in Halton Hills, the heat just gets yeah, that could yeah, go to houses. Right. Sure it could. Even without heat recovery, the new efficient shale gas turbines, and basically what they are are jet engines on the, uh, you know, a, uh, bolted down so they don't take off, right? And they turn, a uh, they turn an electrical turbine at the other end, and they have these great big compressors at this end. So uh, they are, in terms of carbon dioxide emissions, slightly more than twice as efficient as coal. If, if, the, if that's the metric you wish. They operate at about 56% efficiency right now, and that's without uh, uh, heat recovery, whereas the best that coal can do is about 42 43% thermal efficiency. So they are really, and not only that, you can make them, if you want, that small. You put one in every house. Well, maybe not every house, <laughs> but in the future you might have small power co-ops where there is a turbine fed by cheap natural gas that is supplying power to 15 homes. Well, coincidentally, I had the privilege of, uh, of going to Europe about four weeks ago and speaking to some of these people, actually, some of the, some of the director generals in, in Brussels. And uh, Europe is in a very strange state of paralysis right now. Shale gas is so cheap in the United States that international companies, for example, that make fertilizer, and what's fertilizer? Potash, sulfur, and ammonium nitrate, right? Ammonium nitrate, how do you make it? Natural gas. They're actually quietly closing down their ammonium nitrate plants in Europe, or reducing their capacity, expanding them in the United States, therefore jobs are being lost. But the Europeans seem paralyzed. They don't seem to be capable of going forward and saying, all right, we're going to promote the development of this resource that can reduce our carbon footprint even more and help us transition over a period of 100 years or so into an era of more renewables. Germany has been a bit shocked in the last 18 months because it has become apparent that the cost of renewables in Germany is coming in about 50%, depending where you are in Germany, 50% to about 100% higher than they had said to the public some time ago. Now, the public isn't being hurt because the electricity prices are being subsidized. And that's the danger of subsidies. If I have cheap subsidized electricity, I may not use it wisely. But the governments 
are embarrassed by what has happened, and they're keeping the subsidies on electricity. Sarkozy, Monsieur Sarkozy, about a year ago, before the, uh, when he was running for another term, he's put a prohibition on hydraulic fracturing in France. And many people interpreted that as, oh, he's protecting the environment. No, 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 no. He's protecting Electricité de France, the large nuclear power generator that exports to Germany, to Italy, to Spain, to Belgium. Because if cheap natural gas came forward, it would be like what is happening in the United States and Canada. Cheap natural gas, cheaper electrical power. Electricité de France, their nuclear power cannot compete with cheap natural gas. So Europe is in a very strange state right now. I predict that in the next 18 months, you're going to see the United Kingdom throw itself wide open for shale gas development, followed by Poland. Then after that, some years later, other countries will have to, in a sense, follow li the line or suffer from electricity prices that are two or three times higher than those countries. So that's my prediction. I'm not a sophisticated economist to be able to answer that question, except to say that, in general, when you have more potential clients for a product, the, the, the price tends to you know, go up to compete more with the world price. Uh, if you have a single client, and, and that's our case in Canada with much of our, our oil exports, you see, our natural gas actually goes into California, but not our oil. Our oil is just in the Midwest of the United States, so we are in Canada, we. Canadian companies and Canadian provinces are not price setters. They are price takers. Once you get oil to tidewater, that should change because then you have options. Right now, there's no options. So the answer is probably. But again, I'm not an economist. Question there? Yes, we uh, chase uh, the shale gas, uh, and with its apparent environmental impact, will that multiply to the point where it's going to be uh, not sustainable. Well, one of the environmental impacts of shale gas development is a significant reduction in the carbon dioxide emissions. And that seems to be all very, very sustainable. Uh, because there are no more coal-fired power plants being built in the United States. And when the old ones reach the end of their life, they're not being renovated. They're being shut down. So the United States carbon dioxide emissions are dropping remarkably rapidly. And the same thing is going to happen in Canada. With the advent of huge amounts of relatively cheap shale gas, the coal-fired utilities in Alberta, Saskatchewan, and the remaining ones in Ontario, are, and BC, are probably going to be shut down. So yeah, that sounds to me pretty sustainable. Guess, Further, I'm referring to things like groundwater pollution and, and those types of criticisms when here's sure. the fracking. OK, uh, compared to what? Let's compare shale gas development with you know, hydroelectricity. Obviously, hydroelectricity is, has no impact on the environment, right? Except all those rivers up there in Quebec that are now flooded. Uh, all of those habitats have huge lakes on them now. If you, think that there is, if you think that there is no environmental impact from hydropower, go and talk to the Cree in northern Quebec. They will give you a different story. OK? I don't know the story they'll give you, but it won't be the same that you hear on the, on the press. Uh, I can say, and uh, again, I, I, I don't want to uh, sound like a defender of the oil and gas industry. I, I would like to think I'm one of, its, one of its critics, but I'm criticizing on a scientific basis. But I, could, I think I can say reasonably well that the environmental impacts of shale gas development, uh, uh, the negative impacts have been wildly exaggerated. And I, I, could, uh, I, I could give you a number of reasons for that. Uh, for example, People have this idea of hydraulic fractures breaking through here and there into the surface and everywhere. Uh, that's, that has not, that's not the case. Um, without trying to be an advocate of the oil industry or the gas industry, uh, although I must admit I have some sympathy for them. I've worked with them for 40 years, so I know them. 
There is a strong movement on in North America for better regulatory control of these industries, and that is very healthy. The pressure of the governments, the pressure on the governments in Europe, the pressure on the government here in Ontario about renewable energy, it starts to become a real serious issue when renewable energy is five or six or seven times, times, not 5% more, but five times, the cost of, say, shale gas electricity generation. If it was even a factor of 50%, but it's much more than that. It's much more than that. So the pressure is on the, Can the, L the Ontario government to reduce its subsidies for renewable power. So it already has. And it's not funding any new renewable power projects. Uh, the, the renewable power projects will be less competitive with the cheap uh, shale gas and electricity. That's true. But as uh, Dr. Nathwani has suggested, if we all get together and say, look, because 30 years out we're going to flatline on the CO2 and we want to keep on going down, let's put a carbon price on. That will penalize gas and hopefully then make renewables more competitive. But at the end of the day, in our economy, the renewables have to have some modicum of competitiveness. Without that, I don't see how they can survive, except through massive subsidies, which, do you want to pay the massive subsidies? <coughs> I mean, in it's a question. Nothing kind of, I mean, in the US. In the US, the uh, renewables uh, industry is just starting to slip away. There are still massive subsidies for ethanol, but, even those are now being questioned quite seriously. If I read your, your chart correctly, uh, by 2035, um, the Middle East is hardly doing any oil? By 2035, Middle East oil coming into North America will very well be zero. It could be zero. But will their oil industry stay viable? To other parts of the world? Of course. Uh, Japan, India, the Europe, they, they absorb huge quantities of Middle East oil. The United States actually uh, uh, gets only about, overall, about 30% of their oil imports from the Middle East, and that's dropping. Hmm. Yeah. Next question. If, if, there's a, if there's lots, uh, it appears there's lots now, and maybe more in the future which gets developed of, uh, of um, Shale, uh, shale gas in, in England and Hungary. I understand it's being developed in, in Asia and China and so on as well. Very slow. It's a technologically sophisticated. It's very hard to just start it up. Yeah. yeah. Um, you were talking about uh, LNG exports from, from, uh, from BC, and I know it's being they're preparing in the Gulf uh, to export yep. and along the, um, the west coast. How yep. viable is that when, when uh, shale gas is being developed all around the world? One would think that people are going to be self-sufficient and there, there will be a market. Right. So how do you see that playing out over, over time? Well, question. I don't think that any other country other than Canada and the United States, by virtue of their histories, can possibly develop shale gas at the same rate that it has been developed in the United States and Canada. I mean, we have the trained, we have the trained people. We have the rigs, we have the technology, we have the distributed network of gas pipelines to be able to send this stuff off to markets. Uh, we have all of these things in place. We have a service industry that is the envy of the world in the oil and gas drilling and exploration and production business. That service industry does not exist in Hungary. There may be 25 engineers in all of Hungary with good petroleum experience. Here we've got thousands. So that means that there's going to be a window. And that window might last until 2030, where, courtesy of our high efficiency in developing this stuff and shipping it, we'll be able to command an arbitrage price in Japan, South Korea, and maybe some other markets. Except that Australia, Qatar, Trinidad, they all have LNG lines or, or LNG plants being built or already built. They're 10 years ahead of us, and they're building more. So as they build more, then LNG starts to become a very, very fungible commodity all around the world. Mm -hmm. And then we're not competing against the shale gas people in the United States. We're competing against everybody. Yeah. 
So they, but they believe that they have that window of opportunity for five or 10 years to make a lot of money. One would think that there's a, uh, <clears throat> if, if there's money to be made in Hungary or wherever, they don't have the, the engineers, they don't have the technology and so on, a lot of money to be made. They'll just, to, buy, to buy engineers, bring people in. Bring Gee, them. Royal Bank yeah. tried that, didn't they? Huh? <laughs> yeah. hmm. to bring, bring the technology in. If you think that it's easier in Europe to bring in a bunch of yokel Canadians, you know, to work locally, then the Royal Bank believes with their people from another, well. We have, we have Boy. a classic problem here of too much of one thing and too little of the same thing. Uh, geography flattens things out, yeah. but knowing when, that's the problem. When you have too much or too little. It'll, that's why you have the stock markets and they know how to make the money. It'll, yeah. it it'll, it'll happen, it'll happen, but not, not at the pace that you might think it will. Right. Because there, kind of a of there's also institutional uh, issues. For example, I'll give you one, one example. Israel, you know, thought that this company, Noble Energy, I think it's called, the drilling offshore in the deep Mediterranean, at first Israel kind of thought, you know, these guys are just weird. So they gave him a wonderful deal, you know, like no royalties for many years. And then Noble goes and discovers a huge natural gas field, you know, 60 kilometers offshore Israel. Oh, all of a sudden the taxes are starting to be raised, okay? And it doesn't look so good anymore for Noble to try to develop that field. We've been doing this for a long time. Countries that are suddenly trying to do it, not only do they not have the infrastructure and the trained people and the service industry, they think that this is a cash cow to milk. But shale gas is, you know, you tax it to death, it'll die. And that's a problem in Poland. Poland, for example, still hasn't come to grips with the concept of profit. Mm -hmm. It's a problem. They want to tax these foreign companies big time. And it's the foreign companies that have the technology and they can move somewhere else. If you start taxing, like let's say Hungary starts taxing shale gas heavily, the drill, the drill rigs will leave Hungary and go elsewhere. I think from us, yeah. not elsewhere. Oh, for us. Yeah, that's my question yeah. was for like, when you, because we were talking about energy in Canada. Yeah. You know, play but you, you know, your point about local is good because Quebec, is going to understand that the shale gas is not an environmental disaster. It's probably not bad. And they're going to allow development of it. And you know, the irony might be that Ontario might be a very good client for Quebec shale gas. <laughs> Depending on how rich the deposits are and what the costs of development are. Right. Now, if Quebec says, well, you know, we're green, we're going to put a carbon tax on shale gas, then Ontario will probably buy shale gas from West Virginia or Pennsylvania. The, uh, the in situ, uh, let, let's divide it up into mining and in situ. The in situ stuff is probably economically break even somewhere around $50 because they're getting better at it. They're learning how to do it better. For mining, if you have a legacy mine like Suncor, then you can produce and make money at $50 a barrel as well. But if you're a new mine, you need 75 or 80. So that's, that's, that's kind of, or 65 or 70, something like that. I mean, these are, you realize that these are the most secretive numbers of all. The companies just don't release them. So, you know, there's a little bit of, you know, guessing and imagination here. But I don't know if you're aware of it, but pretty well all future mining projects in the oil sands have been basically put on the shelf. There's no market availability for their product until they can see that there is a clear window that they can get their product to market, all of the projects have been put on the shelf. Total. Suncor has canceled the regional upgrader in uh, north of Edmonton. Total has basically said, we're not uh, going forward on the, um, uh, I forget the name of the project. Uh, everybody's on hold. On that note, I would say that it's not only just the oil sands, but just about every other investment decisions in energy infrastructure and energy power plants is in that kind of old mode because you just don't know where the price is going to the, so the, right. the title of this talk was, Your Energy World is Changing. And boy, has it changed uh, tremendously in two, three years. And you, you're not hearing about it in the media. This is impacting all of us, jobs, incomes, you know. Okay. Thank uh, you very much for your, uh, your question. Yeah. And, uh,